welcome first of all to our speaker, Professor Aviles. The introduction to the specific seminar and to the figure of uh, uh, our uh, guest today will be done by Professor uh, Ferrara. It's uh, uh, up to me instead to tell you a couple of words uh, about uh, uh, this specific uh, uh, conference cycle um, we are part of today. Scuola Normale is uh, a small institution in term size-wise, uh, therefore it's very important for us uh, to enrich uh, the uh, cultural offer for our students and for ourselves by inviting uh, speakers here and having guests in various forms. One that we serve to particularly prestigious guests uh, is the present one. This series of talks uh, is organized in collaboration with, with the Associazione Amici della Scuola Normale Superiore, a body, a private body which uh, supports uh, uh, Scuola Normale and that has as a honorary chairman uh, uh, the former president uh, of uh, the Italian Republic uh, and former student of Scuola Normale, Carlo Azeglio Cianti, who is actually the founder of this uh, uh, organization. This cycle started in 1991 with uh, a talk, uh, a series of talks given by Professor Bombieri and of the list uh, of illustrious speakers that you can find on the website, I have selected a very short uh, uh, list up to my personal uh, pleasure and, and fancy. So I will mention uh, Noam Chomsky, Paul Sanker, uh, Professor Cavalli Sosta, and Professor Maria Van. So uh, different topics uh, in sciences and in humanities. Uh, and so, uh, we keep the standard uh, uh, to the highest level with uh, uh, the speaker for today. I wish him uh, uh, a good stay here and I hope the interaction with uh, all of us uh, will be useful and intense uh, also beyond uh, these talks. I myself, uh, as uh, I was telling Avi before, will not be able to attend because I have uh, not given a choice uh, between two possible places to be in here or in the media unions of Scuola Normale Superiore, and guess what, I have to go uh, with the unions. Not my personal choice, as you can understand, but that's what I have to do. I hope I'll, I'll be able to recoup with the next uh, uh, meetings and the next uh, lecture. So thank you for being here, and good work to all of you. Andrea. So, uh, good morning uh, to all the persons that are here and also to the uh, persons that are uh, following us via streaming on the web. Uh, so, it's 11 a.m. here in Italy and uh, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Avi Loeb, uh, who has been awarded the Cathedra Galileana for the year 2011-2012 by the Scuola Normale. So, uh, Professor Lo uh, Lloyd uh, is now the chair of the uh, astronomy department at the Harvard University, and at the same time, is also a director of the newly founded uh, Institute for uh, Theory and Computation at Harvard. So, uh, he's, uh, he, he was born in, in Israel, and where he was trained initially, so he started his career as a plasma physicist, and then uh, once he got the degree from the uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, he then uh, went to the U.S., uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, where he started to get interested in theoretical astrophysics and cosmology, and so uh, he changed a little bit his research field, uh, and then in 1993, he moved uh, to the uh, Harvard University, where he became an assistant professor. Since then, uh, he has worked on uh, different, as I tell in a second, but he also he has been also awarded many prizes, uh, and in particular, he got the uh, Kennedy Prize, the Guggenheim uh, Fellowship, and also the Salpeter Lectureship, among many others. So. Uh, I know, obviously, since 15 years, uh, I've always been struck by um, the breadth and the depth of his research, and uh, he's unanimously considered as 
one of the creative cosmologists in, uh, with, uh, uh, with the flood of ideas that he's constantly producing, and he's also very prolific. Uh, he has written more than 400 papers altogether, many of which are really uh, pioneering and fundamental. So his main expertise is uh, essentially the physics of the early universe. It's, uh, uh, he has done a lot of work on the first stars and first galaxies, cosmic but also on uh, diverse subjects like uh, the uh, physics of the black holes and gamma ray bars. And he has also more recently pioneered the, the field of the 21 centimeter cosmology, which is definitely one of the growing areas of research uh, for what concerns uh, universe sciences. So I think at this point it's uh, time to leave the stage to Avi and uh, invite him to give his first lecture. Uh, so enjoy. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the kind words. Um, it's a great privilege to uh, give these Galilean lectures uh, here in Pisa, uh, home to uh, some of the greatest physicists and mathematicians. Um, and I would like to start with a brief, uh, some brief remarks about our occupation as cosmologists. Um, I get paid, uh, just like Andrea, uh, to think about the sky. And uh, this can be misinterpreted. Um, a few months ago, we had the, our daughter did not feel well, and we had to get a babysitter to take care of her. And the babysitter walked out and spoke to the neighbor. And she said to the neighbor, I had to stay home for a few hours just to finish up a paper. But she said to the neighbor, I think the husband is unemployed because he's at home and plays with the computer all the time. <laughs> Uh, that, that is a misinterpretation of our occupation. Uh, we get paid to think about the sky. And uh, you might naively think that such an occupation has no practical implications, because if we miscalculate the expansion of the universe, nothing bad will happen to our daily life. Unlike an engineer that incorrectly uh, calculates the strain on a bridge, the bridge collapses and hurts innocent people. But the engineer will be the first to correct this naive misconception because uh, Galileo Galilei and um, Isaac Newton came up with their theories, uh, their laws of motion, based on the motion of planets on the sky. So clearly, looking at the sky has practical implications. And bridges are built based on our understanding of the laws of motion. And uh, nowadays, for example, navigation systems, uh, GPS systems, use Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity to get the precision they need. So without that theory that was invented to describe the cosmos, we would not be able to navigate very well. But there is a bigger context to all of this. Uh, and let me illustrate it with an example. If uh, you are born in a place that has a lot of rain, uh, you might wonder, why is it raining all the time? And you might be frustrated with that. If you are born in Boston, where it snows, uh, it's even more frustrating. And you might think that there is some divine entity that controls the weather. But if you have a sense of the big picture, if you get simply an image of the Earth, where you can see the weather patterns and the climate patterns on Earth, then you can understand why there is snow, why there is rain, during some periods of So having the big picture is very helpful for you to get a realistic view of uh, your circumstances, and it prevents you from making inappropriate statements about the origin of the phenomena that you see around us. And the biggest environment that we live in is the universe at large. So our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is a disk galaxy, uh, can we dim the, this light uh, a little bit? Uh, and we are situated uh, at a distance of 25,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This is an image of a different galaxy that is quite similar to the Milky Way, where we can see the disk of stars uh, at a distance. 
And there are many galaxies just like the Milky Way in the universe. And in fact, if you go to a distant location where the, there is not much uh, city life, uh, such as uh, Tasmania near the coast of uh, Australia, you can actually see uh, a beautiful image of the Milky Way galaxy, its neighboring uh, Andromeda galaxy, and other galaxies as well at a distance. And there are tens of billions of galaxies just like the Milky Way filling up the universe. And we would like to understand how this big environment that we live in came into existence, because obviously we're part of it. We're sitting on top of a piece of rock called the Earth that is orbiting a star, the Sun, which is one out of tens of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which is one out of tens of billions of galaxies in the universe. So how did all of this start? Obviously, stars like the Sun or galaxies like the Milky Way did not exist forever. Turns out that uh, as a result of a lot of work, cosmologists have a standard model right now. Uh, over the past decade or so, we firmed up the numbers uh, the, of the cosmological parameters, and I'll try to explain what they are today. And we have numbers with high precision. We have measured those numbers very precisely. And in fact, all these numbers fit on a single page. So you can summarize the initial conditions of the universe on a single sheet of paper. While you need thousands of books in libraries to describe the present state of the universe, right? Uh, even just the politics here on Earth requires a huge number of books. So how is it possible that we can summarize the initial conditions of the universe on a single page and the present conditions of the universe, we cannot even summarize in thousands of books. And the answer is gravity. Gravity makes the universe unstable. And that would be the focus of my talk today. I'll describe how the universe started from simple initial conditions and evolved to have the very complex structures that we see nowadays. And in principle, from the point of view of a physicist, if you take these initial conditions, and put them into a big enough computer, you can calculate the results of the election in the United States in November, in principle. <laughs> but in practice, of course, it's not doable. So what is the standard cosmological model? And here I'll give an introduction to people that do not work in cosmology. I'll try to be as ethical as possible. And, in fact, I'll do it from the point of view of a local, small local region in the universe. This will be a shortcut for the actual mathematics of general relativity, which is more complicated, but it will capture the essential physics of how the universe expands. So the first uh, aspect of the universe is that on very large scales, we find it to be homogeneous and isotropic. This was a simplifying assumption that Einstein so that he could solve his equations back almost a hundred years ago. But we know for a fact, by observing the universe, that on very large scales, it has roughly the same density of matter, and it looks the same in all directions. And this is true on the scale of uh, the horizon of the universe to one part in a hundred thousand. So it's extremely precise. The universe has exactly the same conditions everywhere on large scales. And that makes uh, the mathematics simpler, in a way, because if we write uh, the metric that describes space and time, we can simply put clocks, distribute clocks throughout the universe, and they will tick at the same rate because the universe is homogeneous. So all the clocks, start, if you time them uh, to start at the same time, they will tick at the same rate, and you will have a well-defined concept of the in your metric. And then space itself, uh, illustrated here by the L squared, uh, is, in principle, it could expand. It's not necessarily fixed. In Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, matter curves space, and space itself could be dynamic. And the simplest uh, space that you can think of is a flat space, that is expanding. So in other words, you have the flat space-time, time, and the spatial part has a scale factor which says that every length 
scale in the universe is stretched as time goes on, as the universe is expanding. So the universe currently appears to be expanding, and we have this scale factor that tells us uh, by how much is a given scale stretched as you move from one time to another time. And so you can write the uh, as a flat space times a scale factor squared that defines a length in the universe as it gets stretched. And it turns out that the real universe is, again, the simplest we can think of. It is flat on large scales. So this is a, an excellent description of the real universe. It's homogeneous, isotropic, and flat. And, of course, we know that it expands. So now, now consider ourselves at the center. That's always convenient. People always want it to be at the center. It doesn't really matter where you put the center because the universe is homogeneous. And now you're looking at some galaxy, some source, uh, at a certain separation from us, R. And of course, because the universe is expanding, this separation is growing by the scale factor A. So the separation is changing. That source is moving away from us and goes on, according to the scale factor. And the velocity, if we do the analysis locally, once again, I want to consider a small region, so all the velocities would be much smaller than the speed of light. It would make our calculations much simpler. So the velocity will be just the time derivative of the distance of this source from us. And when we take the time derivative, the only time and quantity is this scale factor. We can define little r as the distance of the source from us today. Just a definition. We tag sources based on their distance today. And then at any earlier time, the source was closer to us by the factor of the scale factor. And when we take the time derivative, we get that the velocity is the time derivative of the scale factor times this so-called little r or co-moving distance. That's the distance today, as measured today. It's a fixed number. Uh, and so the little r is just big R, the actual distance, divided by A. So you end up with the relation that the velocity is proportional to distance. This is called the Hubble relation that was discovered by Edwin Hubble back uh, 90 years ago or so. So the velocity is the time derivative of the scale factor divided by the scale factor. This is the Hubble parameter times the distance relation that actually Hubble inferred observationally. And Lemaitre did it even before him. And the Hubble parameter at any given time is just the time derivative of the scale factor divided by the scale factor. Now we can also ask, suppose this source is emitting a photon that has a frequency nu. Because the source is moving, there is a Doppler effect. So the frequency will shift uh, in time. So if we ask how much does the frequency of a photon, that is, suppose the source emits monochromatic photons. All the photons have exactly the same frequency at emission, but then as we uh, consider different times, the frequency that we detect will change because the source is changing its velocity. The change in the velocity, the, the difference in the velocity between the source and us is just uh, the Hubble parameter times the distance. That's what we uh, derived before, the velocity of the Hubble parameter times the distance. And then we divide by the speed of light to get the, the fractional frequency shift, delta nu over nu. And when you plug in uh, the Hubble parameter, you find that the shift in frequency over the frequency is minus the shift in the scale factor over the scale factor. So the solution to this is the solution to this equation is that the frequency scales inversely uh, with the scale factor. And that has a very simple interpretation. If you consider the wavelength of a photon, which is the speed of light divided by the frequency, then that wavelength can be used as, as a measure of distances in the universe. If you have a source, you can ask how many wavelengths fit within the distance to the source. You can use the, the wavelength as a ruler. And therefore, because distances change in time, wavelengths also change in time in, proportional, in proportion to the scale factor. 
So the wavelength of a photon scales as the scale factor. And in fact, you can um, define the concept of redshift as uh, 1 over the scale factor. So the scale factor is 1 over 1 plus z, where z is considered to be the redshift. That is, that is just the definition. And when people talk about redshift, what they mean is the scale factor. So if the redshift, for example, is z equal 9, then it means that the scale factor was one-tenth of the value that it has today. And the value today is taken to be unity, so the scale factor was 10%. All distances were 10% at that time relative to the, their value today. And so when people say redshift 9, what they mean is that a photon emitted from a source at that redshift uh, had, has a, an observed wavelength which, which is 10 times longer than the emitted. And in fact, we can put ourselves in the middle, as I mentioned before. We are sitting here, and we are looking out, and there is a certain distance out to which we can see. This is the distance that light traveled since the Big Bang. Obviously, there was a beginning in time because the universe is expanding. We can reverse the movie backwards in time, and so all the galaxies will approach each other, and eventually the density of the universe will go to infinity. And that point in time when the density of matter goes to infinity is called the Big Bang. So there was a beginning in time when everything started, when the expansion started, and the distance that we can see is related to simply the distance that photons could have traveled since that time of the Big Bang. So there is a finite volume that we can observe around us, very close to the Big Bang, the universe was what photons could not propagate freely because they were scattered by free electrons. But since a redshift of about a thousand, when the universe was only 400,000 years old, only 400,000 years old compared to the present age, which is 13.7 billion years, that's when the universe became transparent. And we can see all the volume out to this skin which is opaque to us. And these are different redshifts that designate different co-moving distances uh, in the universe. Actually, half of the observable volume of the universe is beyond the redshift of five. And so far, we mapped the distribution of matter only in a small region around us, which, has, which occupies about a tenth of a percent of the observable volume of the universe. So all the cosmological parameters that I showed before are based on measurements that were locally or at this uh, surface from where we see the relic radiation from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. And I'll talk about it later. So what was the expansion history of the universe? To calculate it, we need to consider two uh, elements. First is uh, the, the mass that gravitates in the universe. So we are used to the notion from Newtonian dynamics that only matter, the, the mass density of matter gravitates, but in Einstein's general theory of uh, relativity, pressure also gravitates. And here I denote pressure by P. So the gravitating mass density, the effective mass density that you put in Einstein's equations is the mass, the matter mass density plus three times the pressure divided by the speed of light squared. That's what gravitates. Not just mass density, but mass density plus three times the pressure. And that's all you need to know. And from that, for a homogeneous and isotropic universe, we can derive the expansion history of the universe. So let me illustrate that with a few examples. What kind of constituents could the universe have? Well, it has radiation, I just mentioned it, the cosmic microwave background, relic from the hot phase after the Big Bang. It has a pressure which in these units of C squared is one third of the mass density. That's the pressure of a radiation fluid. And therefore, the gravitating mass density of radiation is twice uh, the actual energy density of the radiation. 
So this comes from the fact that one third times three is one, and you add that to the mass density, so you end up with twice the mass density. Now let's consider the vacuum. We might think that the vacuum is empty, but that's not necessarily the case. According to quantum mechanics, the vacuum can have a certain mass density or energy density. And let's consider the simplest case where it's a constant. It's a constant of nature. So the vacuum has a constant energy per unit volume anywhere we go. And because it's constant, there is no gradient in that energy density. Therefore, the only way to detect it is by the gravitational effect of the vacuum on the expansion of the universe, which is frustrating because you cannot do a laboratory experiment easily to detect the vacuum. All you can do is see if the vacuum shows itself in the expansion of the universe. So what happens to the pressure of the vacuum? Well, one way to derive it is to say, okay, let's imagine a piston that moves inside a, a chamber, a vessel, and of course the uh, energy that is changed as to the piston is the change in the volume uh, times the pr effective pressure of the vacuum. Minus PdV is the change in energy according to thermodynamics. But at the same time, we know that as we open new volume inside this chamber, there would be more energy associated with the vacuum. It will be the vacuum mass density times the speed of light squared, that will be the energy density, times the volume that we opened. So if we compare the two sides, we find that the pressure of the vacuum is negative. Minus P delta V equals rho C squared times delta V. And that means that the pressure of the vacuum is minus the energy density of the vacuum. A very surprising result that has important implications. Because now if you calculate the gravitating mass of the vacuum, you add up of the vacuum plus three times the pressure, and you get a negative value. Because the pressure is minus rho, now you get for the gravitating mass minus twice rho of the vacuum, which means that instead of attracting, the gravitational effect of the vacuum is repulsive. The vacuum accelerates the expansion of the universe rather than decelerate it like ordinary matter or radiation. And as it turns out, as I'll discuss later, this is the current state of the universe. The universe is accelerating its expansion because the vacuum has some finite uh, mass density. And of course, as the universe expands, matter, the matter density drops like one over the scale factor cubed because that's how the volume, a given volume element is changing. Each, uh, si the size of this volume changes as the scale factor and therefore the volume itself changes as the scale factor cubed. The, the, if matter is conserved, its density drops like one over the scale factor cubed. For the radiation, there is another factor, which is the fact that the wavelength of the radiation is stretched, and therefore the energy of, of a photon is going down as um, one over the scale factor. So altogether, the mass density or the energy density of the radiation changes as one over the scale factor to the fourth power. So that's all we need. Now we can calculate the of a spherical shell in a homogeneous an isotropic universe and see how this spherical shell is ex accelerated or decelerated. So we just knew, used the, the, the standard notation of Newtonian dynamics, except that for the gravitating mass, we put now both the mass density and three times the pressure. So we write down the equation for the scale factor. Uh, we are considering a spherical volume surrounded by a, a shell of matter with a radius A, and the amount of mass, gravitating mass, inside this volume is given by the gravitating mass density times that volume, where the volume is 4 pi over 3 times A cubed. And in Einstein's gravity, there is uh, a theorem called Birkhoff theorem that, if in interpreted properly, tells you that you don't need to worry about the mass side of this spherical shell. If you have spherical symmetry, then all you, you care about is how much mass there is interior to that spherical shell. 
And this is equivalent to Newton's uh, iron sphere theorem, where you can consider only the mass interior to a given shell in order to follow its dynamics in spherical symmetry. So this is the equation that we would write, and we can also combine it. We need to know how the pressure is changing as the volume is changing. So we need to combine it with the equation from thermodynamics that says that the change in energy is minus PdV. The expansion of the universe does not change the entropy of the fluids in it because there are no shock waves. The entropy is conserved, so the expansion is adiabatic. And therefore, the change in energy is minus PdV. That's the work uh, done as the, this, uh, a given volume is expanding. And use these equations, we can immediately just combine all these equations to get a very simple result. We end up with, uh, we can simplify this equation for the acceleration by multiplying it by the time derivative of the scale factor both sides and integrating it once, and we find that there is a constant which we can interpret as the characteristic energy per unit mass of that spherical volume, which has the kinetic energy piece and the potential energy piece. And here M is the mass associated just with a, with a density, the, the mass density, not with a gravitating mass density. So this is the standard Newtonian result. We end up recovering it starting from this equation. And if you divide uh, the left-hand side, the constant uh, E that we derive, by netic term, you end up with this result that I wrote here, where the right-hand side has 1 minus omega, where omega is the ma mass density of the universe divided by a critical density. The critical density is just three times the Hubble parameter squared divided by 8 pi g. That's what you get from the math of following the steps that I showed. And if you plug in numbers, you get critical density is cl close to 10 to the minus 29 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. It's uh, of order 30 orders of magnitude uh, more rarefied than the density of this table. Okay, so the characteristic density of the universe is extremely small. Uh, and that's the critical density. And as I will discuss later, omega is very close in the real universe. So a flat universe has the energy, this E, being very close to zero. And in that case, if we consider the universe that we live in, which is one type of universe that, that is allowed by Einstein's equation, in this universe, it's, everything is much simpler. You can basically make omega equal to one, and then omega itself can be broken into different constituents. One of them, matter uh, mass density that goes as one over the scale factor cubed, as I mentioned. Another one is the vacuum mass density, which is a constant. And the, the, the vacuum mass density is constant, but omega of the vacuum, of course, um, is written here uh, in this way. And uh, the mass density of the radiation goes like um, one over the scale factor to the fourth. And the Hubble parameter can be related for omega equal one to its present day value, H naught, through this equation. So this equation basically has a dot over a, the time derivative of the, hub of the scale factor on the left hand side, and the scale factor itself on the right side, and you can solve this first order differential equation, uh, equation to find how the scale factor changes with time. And here, uh, H naught and omega naught, which is the sum of omega matter plus omega of the cosmological constant plus omega of the radiation, uh, which is equal to one for a flat universe. These are the present day values of H and omega. So that's, these are the basics of the expanding universe. And we can calculate, for example, the age of the universe, knowing how the scale factor changes with time, we can translate that to a redshift time relation. So uh, at high, the relation is very simple. 
the age of the universe is very simply related to uh, the redshift. It, it, it's roughly uh, 10 to the 9 years or a billion years when the redshift Z is close to 6. So this is a good number to remember. The universe was a billion years old at a redshift of 6. And then it changes as 1 plus Z to the 3 halves as long as matter dominated the universe. That's true between redshift 1 and redshift 1,000, this, this expression. At low redshift, the vacuum dominates, so this expression changes. At redshift above 3,000, uh, the radiation dominated, and one has to change this expression again. So what is the thermal history of the universe? Uh, we can simply go back in time, and as we go back in time, the wavelengths of, of photons were shrinking, were smaller, and so if you consider a black body radiation field like the cosmic microwave background, it was hotter and hotter as you go back in time. And so as we go back in time, the temperature of the universe, the temperature of the radiation in the universe was higher and higher. So let's start at the beginning. At the beginning that we can imagine, that's when the temperature was close to the Planck uh, energy scale, which is 10 to the 19 GeV, we cannot really forecast very well what happened before that time or around that time. We have some competing theories, but we don't really know which one is correct. Uh, and that, was, that corresponded to 10 to the minus 44 seconds. After that, there was a period of inflation. That's when the universe was perturbed, when density fluctuations were introduced into the smooth picture that I described until now. We don't know when that happened. It could have happened anywhere between a scale of a TTV up to uh, the gut scale or even maybe even the, the Planck time. Um, and then there was a period when uh, ordinary matter, the symmetry of matter compared to antimatter was produced. That's called baryogenesis, the genesis of baryons. We don't know when that happened. There was the electroweak phase transition when the temperature was a TV. That was a picosecond after the Big Bang. Uh, the QCD phase transition, when the temperature was uh, going below a GeV, that happened a microsecond after the Big Bang. Neutrinos decoupled when the temperature was an MeV, that's when weak interactions were no longer strong enough to couple the neutrinos to the rest of the plasma. And then electron-positron annihilation, when the temperature dropped by another factor of two to the mass of the electron, half an MeV. Uh, protons and neutrons combined to make helium and slightly heavier elements when uh, the temperature was somewhere between 0 0.02 up to 0 0.2 MeV, uh, somewhere between half a minute to an hour uh, after the Big Bang. And then the universe became transparent 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And that's when hydrogen formed out of electrons and protons that combined to make hydrogen atoms. The first stars are believed to have formed uh, around 100 million years uh, after the Big Bang, when the microwave background temperature was 100 degrees Kelvin or so. And then the hydrogen in the universe was ionized once again. So early on it was ionized because the universe was hot, Late, later, it was ionized once again after the hydrogen formed because stars formed in the universe and they produced ultraviolet radiation that broke the hydrogen atoms. And today, the cosmic microwave background has a temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin, 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang. So that's a brief history of the universe. Now, of course, when we look at sources, we need to know what, what are the distances of these sources because the flux that we observe depends on distance. So if you take a 100-watt light bulb and you put it at a certain distance, you can, in principle, just by knowing that it's a 100-watt light bulb, you can figure out the distance by measuring the flux of radiation from it. But in cosmology, because of the effect of redshift, you need to be more careful. Without the expanding universe, the flux would be the luminosity of the light bulb, or the source, divided by 4 pi, the distance squared. But in an expanding universe, you have to uh, include the redshift. And 
one way to do that is to say, okay, the source is emitting some luminosity over a certain period of time, dt at the emission. Uh, and of course, uh, you need to take this energy, the luminosity times the emission time, that gives you an energy of radiation that was emitted. You divide it by 1 plus z because of the redshift effect. The energy gets redshifted by the time it gets to the observer. And of course, you need to divide by the surface area of the sphere surrounding the source on which we are situated. We are situated on some spherical surface surrounding the source. So you divide by the surface area 4 pi r squared, and we observe this radiation over a different time interval, dt of the observer. And of course, the ratio of the emission time over the observer time is, again, giving us a factor of 1 plus z, 1 over 1 plus z. So altogether, it turns out, you end up with what you expect, the luminosity over 4 pi r squared, but there is a factor of 1 plus z squared. But because you have redshifting of the energy and also stretching of the time over which the energy is being observed relative to when it was emitted. And you can also define a, a different distance measure which is called the angular uh, diameter distance. And there, these factors of 1 plus z uh, do not appear. So um, the luminosity distance, when you calculate fluxes, is bigger than what we expect without redshift. There is an extra factor of 1 plus z times the co-moving distance of the source. And you can calculate the co-moving distance of the source, the distance of the source today, just by going back to the metric that I showed at the opening slide. And the metric uh, for photons, you simply, uh, they, the photons follow null geodesics, where the ds squared equals zero. And so you can integrate that equation. Uh, you end up with CDT for a flat universe. You just find that the co-moving distance of a source is an integral between the emission time to the observed time of uh, CDT over the scale factor. And you can just follow the math and derive this co-moving distance. And one can calculate this uh, 4 pi luminosity distance squared, this surf effective surface area around the source as a function of redshift. And that, that's shown as the solid line here. One can also calculate the angular diameter distance, which is the angle that a source would occupy if it has a characteristic size. So in this case, I considered a galaxy that has a size of one kiloparsec, and the dashed line shows the angular size of that galaxy on the sky. So of course, very close to us, at very small redshift, the size of the galaxy will go down as you put it farther and farther away. If you put it farther and farther away, it goes smaller. But then, because of the expanding universe, it turns out that once you go beyond the redshift of two, the size, the apparent size of that ruler, of that galaxy, is increasing on the sky. And the characteristic value ranges between uh, a fifth of an arc second up to uh, uh, about um, uh, four fifths of an arc second. Now, the, what are the parameters, the actual parameters of the universe today? Uh, the mass density of the vacuum makes up 72% of the total budget. So omega total is one, uh, out of which 72% is in the vacuum. And the vacuum mass density, to remind you, is constant, okay, to zero order. Uh, the matter density today makes up the rest, 28%. And out of that matter, only 17% uh, or 5% of the global budget is made of ordinary matter, of baryons. So omega in baryons, ordinary matter, is 0 0.05. Uh, the Hubble parameter is uh, close to 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And people usually use this little h to denote uh, the fraction of 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And there are two other parameters that I'll define uh, later. They have to do with density perturbations in the universe. 
So if you look at the pie, the, the budget today, the cosmic mass budget today, uh, the vacuum takes most of it, 72%. Then uh, ordinary matter takes only 5%. And the rest is some unknown form of matter, which is called cold dark matter. We don't know what it is. It, it, it is most likely particles that are very weakly interacting, and that's why we cannot see them. Uh, but we don't know what they are. And uh, the only thing that we know what, what it is is this uh, ordinary matter. And it's, if you look at this chart, you might uh, ask yourself, how is it possible that cosmologists get paid? Because they understand only 5% of the global budget, mass budget. Uh, now, if you go to a redshift between 1 and 100, then the budget is quite different. Uh, because the vacuum density remains constant, it is less and less important as you go to higher redshift, simply because the matter density scales as 1 plus v cubed, or as 1 over the scale factor cubed. So when you go to redshift between 1 and 100, 82% of the mass budget is cold dark matter, and only 18% of that is ordinary matter, but the vacuum makes no effect. It's really negligible at early cosmic times, once you go beyond the redshift of one. Okay. So this was a brief summary of the expansion of the universe on average, a homogeneous and isotropic universe. Now the question is, how do you make objects in it? Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, uh, inside of which stars like the sun form. And the origin of those objects are the density perturbations that are imprinted on this smooth background. So at early times, uh, there was a quantum mechanical process that produced density fluctuations, which is uh, thought to, to have been during the period of inflation. I will not get into the details of how these the perturbations were uh, produced. But then regions that were denser than the average became even denser with time. This is gravitational instability. Uh, simply because uh, they attracted more matter into them. And so eventually, at late times, the expansion of the universe was reversed in these regions because the density was larger than the critical density locally. And so these regions collapsed upon them to make bound objects. And the matter that makes these bound objects came from the voids in between them. So that's how objects are made in the universe, through the process of gravitational instability. And the situation is similar to imagining a rocket that is launched off the surface of the Earth. If the kinetic energy of this rocket is smaller than the gravitational binding energy, then of course the rocket will come back down. And in a region that is denser than the average, when omega is bigger than one, that's exactly what happens. Gravity wins over the kinetic energy of, due to the expansion of the universe. And so a region that is denser than the critical density eventually reverses its expansion and collapses upon itself. And to describe the initial density perturbations, we write the density at a given point in this, divided by the mean density of the universe, minus 1. So this is called the density perturbation, okay, that we start with. And it's a function of space. Of course, given that the universe has small perturbations in it to start with, there are also deviations from the smooth expansion, the smooth Hubble expansion, because as we just discussed, in fact, flows, outflows, get reversed and you get inflows. So clearly, the Hubble expansion is modified in local regions. And we can define the velocity, which is um, the, the difference between the actual velocity of a given point uh, minus what it should have been uh, just due to the expansion of the smooth universe. So now the simplest uh, problem to solve 
optically it would be to say, let's imagine a homogeneous and isotropic universe and perturb it with small perturbations. Let's assume delta is much less than unity. And when we uh, write down the mass conservation equation, which is the top equation here, and the momentum equation, which is the second equation, uh, in an expanding universe, we end up with these equations that uh, include delta and u, where u is the deviation from the Hubble flow. And on the right-hand side of the momentum equation, the second equation, there is the gravitational potential due to the perturbations, the gravitational force acting on the perturbations, and there is also the pressure perturbation produced by an inhomogeneous matter distribution. And, of course, to find the gravitational potential, we need to solve Poisson's equation, where on the right side we have uh, the density perturbation, and on the left side is the potential perturbation associated with it. So when, when these, these equations, in the regime where delta is much less than unity, you end up with this simplified equation. It's a second-order differential equation, which has the Hubble parameter in its uh, second term, and has a right-hand side, which includes a term due to the pressure, it has the sound speed in it, and the term due to the um, rest, uh, just the, the matter distribution in the universe. And uh, if we consider uh, the dark matter, the popular model for the dark matter has no pressure in it, so that's why it's called cold dark matter, we imagine just dust particles following gravity. And for cold dark matter, this second term can be uh, ignored. And so we can solve this equation. It's very simple to solve it. Uh, and one ga gets that the density perturbation grows with time in proportion to the growth factor. This is the growth factor, which is written here as an integral. And actually, at very large redshifts, you can show that this integral gives you just a growth factor proportional to the scale factor. So perturbations in a matter-dominated universe that is dominated by cold dark matter with no pressure, uh, the perturbations amplitude grow in, proportional, in proportion to the scale factor. That's the solution. But if the universe is radiation-dominated, you can show solving a similar set of equations simply because there is uh, radiation dominating the expansion of the universe, and the speed of sound for radiation is the speed of light divided by the square root of 3. You can show that perturbations do not grow much. They grow only logarithmically when radiation dominates. And it's very convenient to analyze perturbations in Fourier space. So you can take the Fourier transform of the perturbations in real space and write down a power spectrum, which is basically the square of the amplitude in Fourier space. And this is a concept that cosmologists use very frequently. So uh, just by these definitions, the amplitude of perturbations on a given mass scale m squared is uh, the wave number k times the power spectrum, P of K, which is delta K squared, where K is the wave number, which is 2 pi over the, the length scale that you're interested in. So it um, turns out that uh, inflation produces a power spectrum of density perturbations that scales as the wave number to the power of 1, close to 1. And then if you calculate the gravity, perturbations, which are associated with a perturbation to the mass times Newton's constant divided by the scale, you end up with the result that if uh, this power law index is close to 1, the potential fluctuations are independent of scale. They are called scale invariant. So on all scales, you have roughly the same potential amplitude fluctuation. And this is what you expect from a period of inflation uh, because during that time you can show that the Hubble parameter is constant and all the modes that exit the horizon have the same amplitude when they exit the horizon and then you, get, you end up, you can show that the potential fluctuations have exactly the same amplitude, independent of scale because you, the system is uh, 
time translation invariant. Now, when you introduce cold dark matter into the universe, uh, there is a special feature that, that when matter radiation, the, the, the mass density of matter and radiation are equal, uh, simply because there is no growth during the radiation dominated phase, and there is a lot of growth during the matter phase, matter dominated phase, and you end up with a turnover of the power spectrum on small scales that were trying to grow during the radiation dominated era but could not really grow. And so the amplitude is suppressed on small scales because there was no growth during the radiation dominated era if you fill the universe with cold dark matter. So then you can calculate the amplitude of density fluctuations. This is the root mean square amplitude of density fluctuations as a function of mass in the universe, in units of solar masses. This is the log of the mass. So a galaxy like the Milky Way is around 10 to the 12 solar masses. And the labels of these different lines correspond to the redshift that you're looking at. So at very early times, at a redshift of 50, the ample, and as you get closer to the present time, the present time is redshift of zero, the amplitude gets larger and larger. And you can see that there is a characteristic scale in the universe at any given redshift uh, above uh, 10 or so, a characteristic scale for which the amplitude is of order unity. So the linear perturbation theory breaks down at that point. But the initial conditions all had delta much smaller than 1. And in fact, you expect the probability distribution of delta to be a Gaussian with this root mean square amplitude as a function of scale. So on a given mass scale in the universe, on a given length scale, uh, there is a Gaussian random field of density perturbation. And people conveniently normalize the power spectrum uh, on this particular scale, which is somewhere between 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 solar masses. Eight, that corresponds to 8 megaparsecs, 8 co-moving megaparsecs today, uh, and on that scale, the amplitude is around 0 0.82 based on the latest measurements. And that's how people express the normalization of the power spectrum on 8 times H inverse megaparsecs scale. Now, if you imagine a region in the universe, as I described before, uh, we can consider a spherical region that has a positive overdensity. Uh, it initially expands together with the rest of the universe, if the rest of the universe has omega matter of one, then because this region has density bigger than the average, it reaches the maximum distance uh, from the center and then it turns around and collapses upon itself. And eventually one makes a virilized object. And you can show that when an object is made, it has a characteristic density that is almost 200 times the mid of the universe. And one can derive the properties of dark matter halos in uh, such regions. So you can calculate, since the density is 200 times the mean density of the universe, given a mass, you can calculate the size, the radius of an object. Uh, and here the radius is expressed in terms of the mass and the redshift. You can also calculate the characteristic virial velocity or circular velocity of the object as a function of mass and redshift. And one can calculate the characteristic temperature of the gas that makes the object. And people, of course, went well beyond these simple models. They did uh, numerical end body simulation where they put uh, test particles that respond to the combined gravitational field. Uh, and you can see as time goes on, uh, redshift is on the top left, it goes down, and the time is ticking on the right side here, on the top right. And as time goes on, co the cold dark matter assembles into a complicated web of sheets, filaments, and objects. So uh, first you get a collapse in one dimension to make a sheet. And then there are multiple sheets that intersect each other. So matter is drained to a filament connecting the sheets. And then along the filament, matter is drained into an object at the intersection of filaments. And that's how objects appear to be made in three dimensions. But the spherical collapse model that I described captures the essential features 
of these simulations. And in this particular simulation done by Volker Springle last year and collaborators, uh, you can see the assembly of a very massive uh, group of galaxies. And we haven't yet at the right time. As you can see, this is only three billion years right now after the Big Bang, and the redshift is 1.7 going down on the top left. And eventually we end up with a system in equilibrium, dynamical equilibrium, that has a lot of substructure in it. That's, of course, an image of the dark matter. And the real problem of cosmology, the reason that we don't have everything solved by now, is because we cannot see the dark matter. So what we can calculate very reliably, because this, this fluid has no pressure, we can calculate very reliably its behavior. It doesn't cool. It's very simple. We cannot observe. We, what we can calculate precisely, we cannot observe. However, what we can observe, the ordinary matter, stars, and so forth, we cannot really calculate very reliably. So we have this problem in cosmology. And you can see that a present-day object has, of course, high density of dark matter at its center, a density cusp, and it's surrounded by a halo which includes a lot of clumps. And we, by now we are approaching the present time. Uh, the redshift is uh, getting to be less than 0 0.1. And you can see the clock ticking and arriving at the present time after the Big Bang. Now, when you examine the density profile of a collapsed object, you find that there is a cusp in the middle and there is a halo in the outer part. And when you analyze many such objects, it turns out that there is, some, there is a general uh, slope to the profile in the different regimes. And there were two fitting formula that people uh, uh, used. One uh, is called the NFW uh, fitting formula, the Navarro Frank and White fitting formula, uh, where the density profile at large distances goes like one over distance cubed, and at small distances goes like one over radius, one over distance. Uh, there is an even better fit with this logarithmic uh, slope that, that is called dynasto, dynasto profile. And in fact, in a paper that should appear um, uh, tonight on um, uh, the archive, uh, we actually uh, try to understand the origin of this uh, distribution. And it turns out that the very simple interpretation where it's coming from is that... Um, the outer slope is quite steep because if you had just an isolated system without any infall, you just make an object and let it relax, then you can conclude that the outer density profile should go like uh, radius to the minus four. And that's just based on continuity of uh, uh, occupation number of energy found energy equals zero. Energy equals zero is what the, the boundary of the object. Beyond that, uh, positive energy particles escape from the object. So just assuming continuity around energy equals zero gives you a density profile that goes like r to the minus four. And in the inner part, there is the radial orbit instability. So if you let the system collapse radially, it's a spherical system, it is unstable. And all, uh, the radial orbits of the particles get isotropized. And you can show that because of that, you must get a density profile that is shallower than 1 over r squared in the center. Again, a very simple consideration argues that there should be a steep outer profile and a shallow profile in the inner part because of the fact that in the inner part the system is self-gravitating and is unstable to purely radial orbits. Now, how do we calculate the abundance of objects in the universe? That's really straightforward because we have um, the density probability distribution, we said it's Gaussian, and now we say that uh, objects that exceed an over-density of unity uh, are uh, collapsing to, to make halos. And so this is an idea that was proposed uh, several decades ago by Press and Schechter, and it's uh, quite adequate to describe the fraction of mass that collapses into objects as simply 
the probability that delta would exceed unity for this Gaussian, which is an error function. Um, and if you take the, the derivative of this error function with respect to mass, you get the mass function of objects. You get how many objects per unit volume you expect there to be as a function of their mass. And you can plot that, and what you find is that at a range of 50, the very object in the standard Koldak meta picture, uh, what I'm plotting here is the mass squared times the derivative of the number density with respect to mass. So this is how much mass there is in objects up to a given mass scale. And as you go to redshift 20, the characteristic mass of objects is of order a million solar masses. At redshift 10, it's of order 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses. At redshift 6, it's of order the mass of the galaxy, uh, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 solar masses. And today, the characteristic mass of objects is around 10 to the 14, 15 solar masses, groups or clusters of galaxies. And the amazing fact is that the amount of mass at the low end it remains constant. It's just that as time goes on, you add more and more mass to more massive objects. So you start with small objects at early times, and they build up bigger and bigger systems. And going beyond the formalism is also possible uh, using uh, a, a formalism that was developed in Fourier space because you can write the density, the over density in a given region as a sum over Fourier modes, delta of k, uh, d3k. You sum over shells in, in Fourier space. And it's, uh, each Fourier mode is independent of any other Fourier mode. So if, as you add up Fourier mode starting from very small k, you build up the object. Uh, and it, basically the amplitude delta does a random walk. And once it uh, gets to a high enough uh, to the threshold, then you know that you made an object. And using this uh, formalism, people were able to derive the mass function of objects more reliably than the press shutter original approach was. Uh, just to remind you, small values of k correspond to large scales. Large values of the wave number correspond to small and, in fact, the pressure of formalism has a problem of a factor of two. You're missing half of the mass in the universe because you're only considering over-dense regions. And under-dense regions have half of the mass. But we expect that mass to be incorporated as well into objects. And that factor of two is recovered in the excursion set formalism. And also it allows you to find what is the chance that an object of a given mass finds itself at an earlier time time, uh, uh, finds itself inside an object of a different mass. Of course, if you include gas pressure, the situation changes. And that's true for ordinary matter. There is pressure. And pressure can resist gravity. So uh, if you want to figure out when is, which factor is more important, is pressure able to suppress collapse or not? What you need to do is consider the time it takes uh, the signal to propagate across the object. So if, if you make a perturbation at the center of the object, there is a sound wave that moves out. And the time it takes the sound wave to cross the object is the size of the object divided by the speed of sound. If the sound wave makes it to the end of the object, then the perturbation will be smoothed out. And gravity will not be able to grow it. The time it takes gravity to grow the object is 1 over the mass of Newton's constant times the mass density of the object. That's the characteristic dynamical time of the object. So when these two time scales are equal, that's sort of the borderline case. If gravity grows faster, then of course gravitational collapse will happen. But if sound waves uh, cross the object faster, then there would be no collapse. And the boundary is called the Jeans mass. In the universe, this boundary is around 10 to the 4 solar masses at a redshift of 10, if you plug in the characteristic numbers. There is another caveat that you have to keep in mind about the baryons. If you consider a region where you put a perturbation for the baryons, uh, at early times, the ordinary matter was coupled to the radiation, the cosmic microwave background. 
And so that fluid of the radiation and baryons, the baryon radiation fluid, had sound waves. And so if you, if you drop a needle at a given point in space, you will get a spherical sound wave moving out at the speed of sound, which is the speed of light over the square root of 3 for radiation fluid. And in fact, that's, uh, you, you basically get the universe filled with sound waves propagating around points where you have perturbation. And each of these uh, spherical shell uh, sound waves uh, admits modes. If you take the Fourier transform of a spherical cavity, you end up getting harmonics. And these are called uh, the acoustic uh, oscillations or baryonic acoustic oscillations. Now, these sound waves basically push the baryons around but they are not shared by the dark matter because the dark matter is not coupled to the radiation. So with, it turns out that without dark matter, the diffusion of photons at, the, uh, at a redshift of around 1,000, the diffusion of photons would have erased all the fluctuations on small scales. And galaxies like the Milky Way would not exist. The only reason that galaxies exist is because the dark matter does not couple to these photons and the perturbations in the dark matter do not get washed out. And uh, the baryons are left after the recombination time when the baryons are, stopping, are, are recombined to make hydrogen atom and they are not coupled anymore to the radiation. Uh, they are still uh, moving around with some relic velocity. There is a baryonic wind relative to the dark matter on cells of a few co-moving megaparsecs. And that affects the assembly of gas into the lowest mass objects with less than a million solar masses. You can think of it as a wind. The baryons are moving in the dark matter because they were coupled to the sound waves in the radiation at early times. Now, uh, this is a simulation of, of the gas that was done by Mark Vogelsberger and collaborator. Uh, and here you can see the results of a simulation that not only includes the dark matter, but also has the motion of the gas that responds to the gravitational influence of the dark matter, including the pressure and the cooling. And right now, state-of-the-art simulations, this is a special called a repo that was used, uh, they provide evidence for galaxies that look just like the Milky Way galaxy, just like galaxies that we see around us. If you start with cosmological initial conditions, you can actually see beautiful spiral arms in this particular galaxy, very similar to the galaxies in the real universe. And this was not true a year ago or two years ago. Just recently, people were able to develop sufficiently accurate codes that give them the ability to make galaxies that look real. So we can say that we are just starting now to build up objects that look just like the real galaxies in the universe when we include gas in the simulation. And you can see that, I mean, this is, of course, uh, a, 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 an image frozen in time. We can look at the galaxy from all directions. Uh, you can see how the galaxy is fed from the large-scale environment where gas is flowing in the galaxy through filaments. And, of course, the fraction of matter that collapses to make galaxies is changing with time. Uh, this is for halos with different temperatures. So, for halos with a temperature of 10,000 degrees Kelvin, the fraction was extremely small, 10 to the minus 4 at a redshift of 20. And then, by the present time, 10% of all the matter collapsed into such halos. Or, in fact, at the redshift below 5, it's already reaching 10%. Today, it's even more than that. It's several tenths of percent. Now, the reason we can learn about how the universe started is because we can do archaeology of the universe. Uh, and that's just thanks to the fact that the speed of light is constant. So when we look at a source uh, at a given distance, the photons had to leave that source at an earlier time in order for them to reach us to do this. And so the larger the distance, the more time it took the photons to reach us. And so we can get an image of how the universe looked like at an earlier and earlier time by looking at more and more distant sources. 
just like archaeology, we are digging deeper into the universe. And we currently have a photo album of the universe. We have an image of the cosmic microwave background at a very early time. We have images all the way to a billion years after the Big Bang. But we are missing uh, some pages in this photo album. Between 400,000 years after the Big Bang, cosmic recombination, and a billion years after the Big Bang. We, don't, we haven't yet imaged how the universe looked like in between. These are called the Dark Ages. Now let me conclude with uh, uh, several slides about the future of the universe, because that, I, I see some young people in the audience and they may be interested in the future, because so far I talked about the past of the universe. Turns out that uh, following the discovery that the universe is accelerating, and that, for that discovery the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded this year, um, I was trying to think what would be the consequences for future observers. If you imagine sources around us, not just running away from us, but running away from us at an ever-increasing speed, eventually a given galaxy will reach the speed of light relative to us. And after that time, you will not be able to observe the photons emitted by that galaxy because it will be moving faster than light relative to us. So it turns out that all the sources that we see nowadays, if the universe continues to accelerate, all the sources will not be visible to us after some time in their future. Turns out that sources beyond the redshift of 1.8, or roughly 2, are already unable to communicate with us. The only reason we see them today is because the photons were emitted a long time ago. But right now, if they send us a signal, we will not be able to receive it. And the situation is analogous uh, to a, a balloon that is expanding. So you can imagine space itself as being the surface of the balloon. So I'm making a two-dimensional analogy here. The surface of the balloon is equivalent to the three-dimensional space that, that we live in, and it's expanding. And you can imagine ants walking on the surface, and the ants represent the photons. So they move at a certain speed, but if the balloon is expanding fast enough, then the ants will visit only a limited area on the surface of the balloon. And that's equivalent to the photons being able to sh show us a small region of the universe that is limited if the universe is accelerating. We can't observe beyond that distance. So if you look at the galaxies around us, you can ask, how will the horizon out to which we can see in time? And it turns out that if you just wait six times the age of the universe from the present time, the, our horizon will occupy a region that is currently only uh, 40 or 30 megaparsecs, very small region around us. Only the galaxies in that region will still be visible to us when the universe ages by a factor of 6 from the present time. And then you can ask, okay, suppose it ages by a factor of 10, just like considering a child that becomes an adult, okay, a child becomes a 50-year-old adult, uh, how, much, how many galaxies will be visible to us in a hundred billion years from now? And the answer to that is one. Only our galaxy. Uh, it will be surrounded by vacuum. Because the vacuum maintains its mass density. It will completely dominate over matter. Matter dilutes as the universe expands. And in the future, we will not see any other galaxy except for our own. And, in fact, it's not just the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, right now, next to the Milky Way galaxy, there is a sister galaxy called Andromeda, and it's approaching us. And eventually, it will collide with the Milky Way galaxy. So this merger product will be the only galaxy visible to us. And I actually called it Milcomeda uh, to give it a name for future people. Um, and it turns out that this merger product is the only cosmological object that will be observable in the future to astronomers. Once the universe becomes 100 billion years old, the collision, the collision between the two galaxies will take place during the lifetime of the sun, only a few billion years from now. And the night sky, of course, will change, because right now we see mostly the Milky Way disk on the sky. That's the strip of the Milky Way. But as Andromeda is approaching us, it will cover a huge fraction of the sky. And we simulated this process with uh, T.J. Cox, a postdoc uh, at Harvard, back then, 2007. This is the only paper that I wrote that has a chance of being cited in five billion years. 
And you can see here the situation where you have the Milky Way and Andromeda approaching each other. And you can see on the left uh, the gas distribution and on the right the stars that get mixed together as time goes on. And the galaxy, the, the merger product is an elliptical galaxy. We find lots of elliptical galaxies, just that our environment here uh, happens to make an elliptical galaxy relatively late compared to other regions in the universe. And you can see here the history of the merger. Within about two to three billion years, the two galaxies will pass next to each other, and then the, they will come back and make a single galaxy about five billion years from now, or six billion years. You can ask what will be the fate of the sun. Well, uh, you can put a lot of suns in a ring today, at uh, uh, the same distance as the sun from the center away. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to predict exactly what will happen to the sun because there are many uncertainties about the Milky Way that prevent us from making a, a, a very a precise prediction. But you can look what happens to these suns. Uh, this is the distribution of distances from the center of the merger. Uh, and as time goes on, uh, these suns get scattered. And the, most of the, ch uh, the highest probability is that the sun will get kicked out to a distance which is twice or three times the current distance from the center of the Milky Way. And uh, just to summarize what I, I talked about, um, if we were to consider the past of the universe, uh, you can say that cosmologists right now are exploring the scientific version of the story of Genesis. Uh, let there be light. And the past of the universe is uh, a modified version of the view that uh, religious texts had and philosophical texts in the distant past. So you can say that uh, religious ideas about Genesis are modified by science. Right? Uh, however, when you think about the future, uh, the merger product of the Milky Way and Andromeda will be the only galaxy that we can see in the distant future, once the universe ages by a factor of 10. And future generations of observers will not be able to find direct evidence for the Big Bang because there will not be a microwave background. There will not be other galaxies that we can look at. So there would be these textbooks, like the textbook that I, I just wrote recently, that will tell us that there was a Big Bang, but we will have no way of checking it on the sky. So the question is, will cosmology become a religion at that point? There will be stories about the Big Bang without any way of verifying that they are true. So I was actually, try, I gave this, uh, I, I mentioned this question in a popular talk that I once uh, gave a year ago, and people came to me afterwards and they were very troubled by this question, will cosmology turn into a religion in the distant future? In fact, when the universe ages by a factor of 100, if you consider a trillion years from now, the wavelength of the microwave background radiation will be stretched to be bigger than the size of our horizon because it grows exponentially. It will grow from 2 millimeters to the size of 10 to the 28 centimeters. And there will be no, no more meaning to talking about a microwave background photon. There will be just a constant electric field stretched across the entire universe for a given photon. So there will be no evidence for the Big Bang. And even there will be no atoms in, outside of our galaxy in principle. So there was one day of heavy snow last winter, and all events at Harvard were canceled. Uh, so that was a very rare event where I had comp a free time, complete day for myself. And I thought about this question. Is it true that we will have no way of telling that there was a Big Bang in the distant future? Turns out that the answer is no, in fact, you can say something about the expanding universe a trillion years from now. And the reason is our galaxy is ejecting stars. These are called hypervelocity stars. Near the center of our galaxy, there are processes close to the black hole at the center of our galaxy, processes that kick stars out once every 100,000 years. These are called hypervelocity stars. They are able to escape from the center of the galaxy all the way to the edge of the galaxy and leave the galaxy when we see those stars. So these stars will still get kicked out in the distant future, a trillion years from now, and there will be, uh, 
they will serve as a source of light outside of our galaxy. And when they go far enough from our galaxy, they, their, their, their uh, expansion away from the, from the Milky Way will uh, be dominated by the vacuum mass density. So they will serve just like the uh, sources of light that Edwin Hubble used in the form of galaxies to infer that the universe is expanding. You could look at those distant stars and see that their recession velocity depends on their distance in a very, very perfect way, and you can measure their acceleration away from us. So you can infer that the universe is accelerating, that there is a vacuum mass density from the stars that escape the Milky Way galaxy, the, the Milcomeda galaxy. And in this paper that I wrote, as a result of that, uh, I showed that, in fact, you can estimate the matter density when Milcomeda was made, and you can uh, calculate the time that elapsed since the Big Bang in, uh, based on the ages of the star in Milcomeda. A trillion years from now, there, there will still be stars. Uh, a star that is a tenth of the mass of the sun has a characteristic lifetime of seven trillion years or so. So the future is not that dark. A trillion years from now, we can still do cosmology. But the bottom line is that you might want to invest most of the funds in observing the universe within the next uh, few billion years, uh, just so that we have a good record of what happened during the Big Bang. And future generations of observers will have to believe us uh, that this really took place. If you wait more than 10 trillion years from now, there will be no stars after that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avi, for this fascinating lecture. It reminds me why I became a cosmologist, after all. So, uh, before we pick up a couple of questions for Avi, uh, let me remind you two things. The first is that Avi will spend here 10 more days until uh, uh, July the 5th, and is staying in Office 81 here, so I guess uh, he will be happy to talk with anybody who is interested to uh, discuss with him. And the second thing is that tomorrow we will have the second lecture, which will not be in this room, but it will be in the aula uh, on the same floor here, and then next week we'll come back here. So, uh, questions now, is there any for Avi? Yes, yes. Um, obviously, the role of dark matter has become less relevant with the advent of dark energy. Still, where precisely uh, does the evidence that the dark world come from? Why is it not relativistic? Right. Um, so, um, if you remember, I had a slide about um, the genes mass uh, or the effects of pressure on the behavior of gas. So now we can imagine the dark matter being a fluid that has an arbitrary pressure, okay? Let's try to put constraints on its sound speed or pressure, characteristic pressure. Uh, we can do that from um, the structure that we observe on cells, because if uh, a fluid has a lot of pressure or it's not cold, it will not be able to make small objects. On small scales, pressure, the pressure gradient force will win over the gravitational force, and that, that will wash out structure on small scales. So, in principle, um, by observing structure in the universe uh, on different scales, you can set limits on how cold the matter should be. And when people talk about cold, they uh, mean to say that it's cold enough to make all the objects that we see and the structures that we see. If they allow, for example, the dark matter to be warm or actually hot, uh, neutrinos, for example, are hot dark matter. So, if you Imagine the universe made only of neutrinos that have a characteristic mass of a fraction of an electron volt. In that case, you will not make almost any objects. Even clusters of galaxies would not be made uh, if there were other matter in the universe because the characteristic uh, scale over which you smooth the fluctuations can be as large as 100 uh, co-moving megaparsecs. It's very big. So in order to allow structure to form, you need to have um, a cold enough fluid 
so that it makes it on small scales. And the characteristic scale that gets smoothed out, you can easily estimate it. It's the characteristic uh, random speed of the particles, the characteristic sound random speed of particles, uh, times the age of the universe gives you a distance over which particles travel since the Big Bang. And over that distance, they can smooth out the fluctuations. Even if they are collisionless, they just spread over some distance and you lose um, density f fluctuations on scales smaller than that. So for neutrinos with a sub-electron volt mass, this scale is, is very big. You know, for their 100 megaparsecs, you cannot make any object. But the dark matter is assumed to have small enough random speed such that now, it's not zero because we know, for example, if we consider weakly interacting massive particles, they were, um, they, they were coupled through weak interactions to ordinary matter, uh, uh, and uh, they decoupled in popular models when the temperature was around the 10 MeV. So they had a finite temperature at that time, but since that time, if the particles are massive enough, they, they cool, and the temperature drops so that today it's not significant. You can calculate what is the minimum mass of the clumpiness of weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs, and it's of order the mass of Jupiter, very small, if they decouple the uh, uh, temperature of 10 MeV and they have a mass of around 100 GeV per particle, you end up with um, the, the genes mass being extremely small, of order the Jupiter mass. So that's the idea of cold dark matter. But we don't really know what it is. It could be, for example, small black make the dark matter. Black holes with a mass of order 10 to the 20 grams that do not have, uh, that do not evaporate through the Hawking radiation during the age of the universe, but also have a small enough mass so that you can't see evidence for them in microlensing searches or dynamical evidence that otherwise would reveal that the dark matter is made of black holes. So as long as they are very massive and they decay early enough, their temperature will drop so that by the present time they are not uh, so the thing about neutrinos neutrinos are hot dark matter because their ma the mass of the neutrinos is extremely small less than an electron volt Oops. Uh, any other questions Ricard so I, I, under I understand that you consider the current time as relatively special uh, do you think that it's interesting to try to understand why that is the case? And if so, do you have an answer to this question? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there are many interesting things about us that are special. Each of us looks different. Uh, the Earth looks different than other planets. The Sun is different than other stars. The question is whether you assign significance to that. Um, and it turns out that the physics community, because for several decades there was not experimental, experimental data in particle physics, um, people started to develop ideas that uh, are difficult to test experimentally, but touch on this issue. And in particular, they asked, why is it that the vacuum has a mass density that appears to be non-zero and has a value that is just now becoming important. Okay? And it turns out that in string theory, you can have, the vacuum can have many different possible states, 10 to the 500 possible states, and the special state that we live in is uh, characterized by a very low vacuum mass density compared to the typical state that has Planck mass uh, Q, uh, to the fourth power energy density. Um, so, they said, okay, well, let's examine these other possible universes that have other vacuum energy densities and arrived at the suggestion that perhaps the reason we live in this universe and right now the vacuum starts to be important is because there is the requirement that we exist. In order for us to ask this question, this is the anthropic argument, in order for us to ask this question now, galaxies like the Milky Way have to be made. And if you make the vacuum much more dense, then the universe would accelerate early on before galaxies were made. So you would never make a galaxy like the Milky Way, you would never make a star like the Sun, we would never exist to ask this question. So if you consider all the possible regions in the meta-universe, not our universe, but all the possible regions of space outside of our region, 
where the vacuum density is different, and you ask, where would I find people that ask this question? It's only in those regions that allow galaxies to form. And this is a philosophical argument, very difficult to test because we cannot visit other regions easily. And it's an example of an argument to explain the special circumstances that we live in through a arg philosophical argument that physicists appeal to because of lack of data, I guess. That there is no, if, if we had a way of actually boarding a spaceship that will take us outside of our region of space, going to many different places and checking what is happening there, we would know much better why we are, we are having this condition. And so this, as far as I'm concerned, this is uh, not physics in the traditional sense. You cannot easily test it. It's interesting to think about it. Why are the special conditions that we witness uh, the way they are? But I would find it more exciting if we had a way of testing the theoretical explanations that people come up with. Um, and so I, I think that this, this question is extremely interesting. The question, the, the more important aspect of it is whether if you explain it, you can come up with a prediction that can be tested. Okay? And that's the way we make progress. Because otherwise, you know, this would be a possible interpretation, but we will not be sure until we have a prediction that can be tested whether it's right or not. And the strength of physics is experimental testing. Without it, it's philosophy. So that's, that's my short answer to that. Okay, so in my discussion here about the future of the universe, I guess the vacuum mass density remains constant. It's quite possible that it's not. Um, for example, if we consider inflation, that was an early time in the history of the universe, during that time, the vacuum dominated as well. And the, we know that the universe uh, expanded like that exponentially during inflation for at least 60 e-folds. We know that because uh, we know the size of the horizon if inflation took place at the grand unified scale. And we know the size of the horizon today. And in order for inflation to make the universe smooth on the size of the horizon today, it needed to have at those early times at least 60 e-folds, 60 exponential times. Um, and so the predictions I made about the future went a trillion years from now, which is roughly um, 70 or 60 e-folds from now, you say, uh, we don't know if inflation took place more than that, uh, much more than that. Of course, we cannot really say if our vacuum right now will stay constant for more than 100 e-folds or even for a few e-folds. But I just made the conservative simplest assumption that you take the standard cosmological model with a constant vacuum density, and so far all the data is consistent with it, and you just say that it stays constant. If you consider string theory, each of the vacuum states is extremely stable. In order to perturb you, you need to uh, deposit uh, a huge amount of energy uh, of order the Planck scale in the vacuum in order to change it to another vacuum state. It's very difficult for the vacuum to tunnel into a different state with different energy. And so if that's really the case, then we will be stuck with this vacuum that we are in for a long time into the future. But we don't really know if string theory is correct, and maybe the vacuum will decay. So actually, people are willing to invest a billion dollars, both here in Europe and in the United States, two separate projects, projects Euclid in, the, in Europe and W first in the United States, with a roughly a billion dollars per project to find out if the vacuum is constant within time, to the level of a few percent or one percent precision. They are willing to invest a billion dollars to find out if the vacuum is constant within one percent over the age of the universe. Uh, it's difficult for me to imagine that future generations will invest more money just to find that it's constant to within a tenth of a percent. Because there is no end to this. If you find that it's constant to 1%, you can continue to refine it. But as of now, people are willing to do that. And my expectation is that they will find that it's constant. Or if they find that it's not constant, something is wrong with the interpretation because they use astrophysical uh, uh, sources for that. So they will have to work very hard.
are two that it's, uh, it's non-astrophysical and it's not constant. But right now, all the evidence is that the vacuum is constant. That's what I assumed in the most conservative model to predict the future. And the future for cosmology appears very um, disturbing, very uh, lonely. We will be surrounded by vacuum. Nothing cosmological around us except for the Milcomeda galaxy. And that's... Uh, so we live in a special time because now we can do cosmology. We get paid for that. In the future, we will have no data. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there any other questions? Or uh, maybe we, <laughs> we leave Avi to rest a little bit and uh, go for lunch. And so uh, we hear the rest of the story tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Uh, so this is just the first lecture. We have three more to go and a lot of uh, interesting stuff to come. So thank you again, Avi, thank and you. I'll see you tomorrow.